One way to calculate the volume of a loaf of bread is to slice it into slices and calculate the volume of each slice separately. That's the idea to keep in mind as we cover this topic on volumes using cross sections. A lot of three-dimensional objects are kind of like loaves of bread and can be naturally sliced into slabs or slices like this. Let's suppose we've sliced our object into n slabs. We'll call them S1, S2 through Sn. In this picture, n is 7. Here's S1, here's S2, here's S3, and so on. We'll assume we've sliced in such a way that each slice is the same thickness. We'll call that thickness delta x. Well, the volume of the solid is just the sum of the volumes of the slices. In sigma notation, we can write this as the sum from i equals 1 to n, the number of slabs, volume of s sub i, the i slab. Now the volume of the i slab is approximately its cross-sectional area times its width. By cross-sectional area of the slab, I mean the area of the front or the back part of the slice where you might spread peanut butter. Well now, as you've noticed from making peanut butter sandwiches, the area of the front of the slice might be slightly different from the area of the back of the slice. So what we'll do is for each interval i, each slab, we'll just pick a sample point, x sub i star, that's in that ith interval, it could be on the left endpoint, or it could be on the right endpoint, or it could be in the middle somewhere. And we'll just look at the cross-sectional area. I'll call it A at x sub i star. That represents the area if I were to go karate chop right at that x sub i star and figure out the cross-sectional area at that point. Now we can go back and write our volume as the cross-sectional area at x sub i star times delta x, the thickness of the slice. Now this is just an approximation of volume because this expression here gives you the volume as if the slices are very regular and have the same area from one side to the other. But it's a good approximation if the slices are thin and in fact we can calculate the exact volume by taking the limit as the slices get thinner and thinner, or in other words, as the number of slices goes to infinity. What we have here is the limit of a Riemann sum, and therefore we can rewrite it as an integral, where the xi star becomes our variable x and the delta x becomes our dx. For the bounds of integration, We'll just use the abstract x values of a and b. For a real problem, we would fill these in based on the context of the problem. This gives us an abstract expression for the volume of a three-dimensional object. But in practice, in order to compute volumes like this, we'll first need a formula for a of x, the cross-sectional area, as a function of x. As an example, Let's try to find the volume of a solid whose base is an ellipse, given by this equation, and whose cross sections perpendicular to the x-axis are squares. First, let me graph the base. It looks like an ellipse that's thinner in the x-direction than in the y-direction, so something like this. Now, sitting above this base are a bunch of squares, and the squares are oriented in such a way that they're perpendicular to the x-axis. So they're oriented sort of like this. I'll try to draw a square here. That's supposed to be coming out of the picture here. And here's another square, again, coming out of the picture. Here's a slightly better picture that I drew using Mathematica. It's tilted, so we're looking at it from below where you can see the ellipse here and you can see the square cross sections. The x-axis is going in this direction. That's x, and the y-axis is in that direction. This picture is actually an approximation of the solid, where they're only about 
eight or ten slices. Each one's kind of thick and has the same area on the front and the back. A better picture of the solid is this one. Here the slices are infinitely thin, but they're still square shaped and they're still oriented in such a way that they're perpendicular to the x-axis. Now we know that volume is given by the integral from a to b of area as a function of x dx. On our ellipse, the minimum x value is negative 2 and the maximum x value is 2. So I can write those in for my bounds of integration. Also, I know that the area of a square is just the side length squared. So I can write my cross-sectional area as s of x squared, where s of x is the side length of the square as a function of x. Notice that for different x values, my side lengths are different, but my side length is always twice the y value, twice the distance from the x-axis to the y value on the ellipse. So I'll rewrite my formula as 2 times y as a function of x squared. And I can simplify this a little bit as the integral of 4 times y of x squared dx. Now all I need to do is find a formula for y as a function of x. And since I've got this equation up here relating y and x, all I have to do is solve for y in terms of x. In fact, I can get by solving in for y squared since I've really got y squared in my formula. Solving for y squared, I have y squared over 9 is equal to 1 minus x squared over 4, which means that y squared is equal to 9 times 1 minus x squared over 4. Now I'll plug this into my volume equation, and I get the integral from negative 2 to 2 of 4 times 9, 1 minus x squared over 4 dx. I'll pull out the 4 times 9, that's 36, and integrate. Plugging in values and simplifying, we get a final answer of 96. Now, how would this problem be different if we used cross-sections that were perpendicular to the y-axis instead of the x-axis? Well, for one thing, our picture would look a little bit different since our squares would now be running in the other direction. Since our squares are now thin in the y direction instead of the x direction, it makes sense to have the width of a slab be delta y and to compute our volume as an integral with respect to y. Our bounds of integration now need also need to be y values, so they run from the minimum y value of negative 3 to the maximum y value of 3, and our cross-sectional area should also be written in terms of y. Area is still side length squared, but now our side length is actually twice our x value instead of twice our y value. And we can write our x value squared in terms of our y value as 4 times 1 minus y squared over 9. Therefore, our area, which is our side length squared, which is 2x quantity squared, or 4x squared, is going to be equal to 16 times 1 minus y squared over 9. And we'll need to calculate our volume by taking the integral from negative 3 to 3 of 16 times 1 minus y squared over 9 dy. If we integrate this, we get an answer of 64, a different answer from the answer to our first problem. And it makes sense that we get a different answer because we now have a different three-dimensional object with a different shape and a different volume. In this video, we saw that if we divide a three-dimensional object into slices, then the volume of the three-dimensional object is the integral of the cross-sectional area dx.